It's time for our Bible study on this Wednesday night, the, the 20th of July in 2022. Uh, we've been doing virtual Bible study for three years now. It's been a while. Uh, and we were actually hoping that uh, eventually we'd be able to get to uh, being able to do this uh, in person. Um, the pandemic has reared its ugly head again, so we're still doing it virtually and the Lord is blessing even in the virtual way uh, so we're going to go ahead and get started tonight hopefully won't keep you very long uh, I do uh, and ask again that you would uh, grab your Bibles and uh, read with us tonight uh, as we study the Word of God from the book of Genesis can we offer a word of prayer God tonight we thank you again for the opportunity to gather and we pray that uh, what we do and say will be pleasing in your sight God, our understanding, God, our minds and our hearts, so that we might be directed only to those things which you would have us to see, hear, and do. Forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness and allow us once more to enter into your throne room and uh, to learn more from your holy word uh, so that we might be better, stronger, and wiser. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. So, tonight... Uh, we are getting back into the study in Genesis, and we're going to be in, in uh, chapter 25 uh, in our study. Uh, we're going to be looking at the origins of our faith, as we've been doing all along, and particularly tonight, we're going to look at Isaac and the covenant, uh, some dispute over wells, and uh, we'll close out talking a little bit about uh, the wives of Esau. Mm -hmm. As we get started, I want to point out to you that uh, uh, the uh, variant proportions in uh, the United States with regard to COVID-19 um, have um, uh, indicated that BA5 is uh, clearly the predominant subvariant of Omicron uh, that, uh, that's out now. It's comprising about 78% of all of the, of the variants uh, isolated. Um, right behind it in is BA4, but it's substantially less. It's only about 13%. Before it was 16% uh, two weeks ago. And then uh, decreasing substantially is uh, BA2.1, 2.1. It's only down to about 8.6%. We, we have a little bit of BA2 uh, at 0.6%. So clearly what we're seeing now is predominantly BA5. It seems to be associated with um, a, a highly uh, um, uh, infectious uh, a character and uh, it can um, lead to some atypical symptoms. Uh, you know, people are getting more upper respiratory tract type in, uh, uh, symptoms, uh, uh, colds, uh, allergy type symptoms, uh, some headaches. Uh, some people are getting some uh, fevers, maybe even some nausea. Um, we're not seeing as much in the way of severe illness um, in terms of uh, severe shortness of breath or fevers, severe uh, uh, night sweats, that, that kind of thing, or chills. But, you know, we, we're seeing some of that, uh, but not, not a lot. Uh, and that's, that's a good thing. Uh, we don't know if that's going to flip. Now that BA5 is clearly predominant, uh, a predominant subvariant, uh, but right now we're seeing infections, but not real severe infections overall. 
if we look at what's happening in Bear County, we see that we're up to about 591,000 total cases since the pandemic started. Uh, new cases just yesterday were at 663, which is down from about this time last week. There was one death reported. And actually, when you think about it, um, um, back at the height of the pandemic, uh, say with the, with the Delta variant or with the original variant, uh, we were having multiple deaths per day. Uh, any death is too many, uh, but uh, certainly we're not having that same number of deaths as we had uh, early in the pandemic. We had 326 people hospitalized, 61 people in the ICU. So the number of people going to the ICU um, is creeping up. So we have to keep an eye on that. The number of people on the ventilators is about 15, uh, about stable. Um, and when we look at the new case rate, that would be the number of new cases per 100,000 people of the population. Uh, that's about 362.7, up about uh, 33.5 points uh, percentage-wise. Hospitalization rate is at uh, 23.6, also up about 3.8. So uh, again, this pandemic is still there. Um, the community spread is still high, um, and we just have to be aware of that. And, and work very carefully to keep ourselves uh, safe uh, in, in every aspect, uh, at church, uh, at home, on your job, uh, when you go out to the restaurants and grocery stores, um, make sure that you're doing the simple things that uh, can keep you, keep you safe. So what are the things that you can do? Again, just to review this, uh, Make sure you get vaccinated, get an update booster, uh, maintain facial mask when indoors. I think that's extremely important. Maintain appropriate distancing, reduce prolonged periods and large gatherings. Stay home if you're sick and stay home if you've been uh, possibly exposed within the last five days. After isolation for five days, if you have an infection, wear masks strictly for an additional five days. Those are the things that we can do to keep ourselves safe. Well, let's look at where we are with, uh, with Genesis. We know that we've talked about the creation and the fall of man. We looked at Noah, Tower of Babel. We looked at the travels of Abram, Sarah, and Lot, and those uh, situations between uh, uh, Abram and Sarah, becoming eventually Abraham and Sarah, and their interactions with Hagar. Uh, we talked about uh, Isaac and Rebekah um, as we looked at the death of Abraham and then the birth of Esau and Jacob. And so tonight we're going to look at Isaac, the son of Abraham and Sarah, and the covenant that, uh, that now comes to uh, Isaac as uh, the son of Abraham. We'll talk a little bit about dispute over wells. That's an interesting story and end up with uh, just a brief statement about Esau's wives. Uh, the first question is, when is it appropriate to ask someone to leave because he is too good or she is too good, too prosperous or too large? When is it appropriate to ask someone to leave because he is too good, too prosperous, or too large. Now it seems like the Spurs did something like this um, with DeJounte Murray. Uh, I could not understand, I still don't understand for the life of me, uh, why they let this young man go. Uh, what I read was uh, his, his last season was such a good season that his renegotiated contract would would affect the Spurs salary cap and they they thought it would be best for this organization and best for him uh, that DeJounte Murray uh, would go to a different organization he's too good okay well I found out recently that that may not have actually been the whole situation because <laughs> because DeJounte Murray apparently was being um, I guess cyber bullied by uh, someone who was a Spurs fan. He came back uh, saying that he, uh, he he really didn't want to be here in the first place or something to that effect. I don't know. I don't know. But anyway, is there is there a time when someone is too good, too prosperous, too large that you should ask them to leave? 
and is that ever appropriate? So, so Sister Regina Peaches said probably not appropriate unless mm -hmm. they are causing some type of psychological or physical trauma to others, mm -hmm. but not simply because of our own bruised ego or hurt feelings. Ah, okay. Okay. Dr. Lillian Jones says when others are significantly jealous of him or cannot get along with him, Deacon mm -hmm. Thomas Levine says when their prosperity is accompanied with deceitfulness in their actions towards you. Hmm. Sister Allison Martin said it is never appropriate for anyone to do something that like that because being good uh, because of being good or prosperous because being good or prosperous is not a crime mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. Sister Paula Johnson said I do not think it's appropriate for you to ask someone uh, to leave uh, I just don't maybe you can sit down and have uh, a chit chat and fix it <laughs> um, yeah. and okay. then uh, Reverend Grady Porter said Abimelech asked Isaac to leave was mightier than we. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. So let's talk about it a little bit in this section uh, because we're going to see that prosperity of um, of of the patriarch Isaac uh, actually ended up prompting uh, his uh, his dismissal by the people around him. So let's look at Genesis 26, verses 1 through 16. Uh, Genesis 26, verses 1 through 16. God's covenant with Isaac confirmed. This is what the King James Version says. And there was a famine in the land uh, beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went unto Abimelech, king of the Philistines, unto Gerar. And the Lord appeared unto him and said, Go not down into Egypt, dwell in the land which I shall tell thee of. Sojourn in this land, and I will be with thee, and will bless thee for unto thee and unto thy seed. I will give all these countries, and I will perform the oath which I swear unto Abraham thy father. And I will make thy seed to multiply as the stars of heaven, and will give unto thy seed all these countries and in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed because that Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge my commandments my statutes and my laws and Isaac dwelt in Gerar and the men of the place asked him of his wife and he said she is my sister for he feared to say she is my wife lest said he the men of the place should kill me for Rebecca, because she was fair to look upon. And it came to pass when he had been there a long time that Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out at a, at a window and saw, and behold, Isaac was sporting with Rebecca, his wife. And Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, of a surety she is thy wife, and how says thou she is my sister? And Isaac said unto him, Because I said, Lest I die for her. And Abimelech said, What is this that thou hast done unto us? One of the people might lightly have lain with thy wife, and thou shouldest have brought guiltiness upon us. And Abimelech charged all these people, saying, He that toucheth this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. Then Isaac sowed in that land and received in the, in the same year a hundredfold, and the Lord blessed him. And the man waxed great and went forward and grew until he became very great. For he had possession of flocks and possession of herds and great store of servants and the Philistines envied him. For all the wells which his father's servants had digged in the days of Abraham his father, the Philistines had stopped them and filled them with earth. And Abimelech said unto Isaac, Go from us, for thou art much mightier than we. Mm -hmm. now, that's an interesting story. Let's look at it. We'll break break it down uh, in a few parts. So the very part of the the very first part of the story talks about the covenant being reiterated to Isaac. Again, we're seeing this covenant, the same covenant that was given to um, Abraham, 
now being reiterated to Isaac, uh, the, the son through whom God had chosen to perpetuate the promise. All right, we got that, right? So that's the first thing. And then we find something that's set up that's almost the same as the story of Abraham during a famine in the, in the <coughs> earlier part of Genesis. It's almost the exact same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, so this time a famine came up in the land like, as in the days of Abraham. And God told Isaac not to go to Egypt during the famine. Now, now remember when the first famine came through, Abraham went into Egypt uh, and got into trouble in Egypt because he lied about his wife, saying that she was his sister and not his wife. Right, and so the the Egyptian uh, king basically said, "You got to get out of here. Uh, I'll let you take what 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 you've gathered. You you must leave." And so he left. Of course, then he did go a second time and lie about his wife. You remember that? Mm -hmm. when, they, when Abraham went into Gerar, not because of a famine, but he went into Gerar, and he had a conversation with Abimelech. Now, do you think it's the same Abimelech as in the days of Abraham that Isaac now encounters in Gerar? Think about that a little bit. Abraham said to Abimelech that his wife was his sister. Uh, but this time around, um, uh, Abimelech gave riches unto unto uh, Abraham and and allowed him to to stay in that area. Um, and Abraham flourished. Well, this time, in, in this situation, Isaac goes to Gerar, same Gerar where Abraham went, speaks to an Abimelech, says his wife is his sister. Uh, uh, however, he does not get riches, you know, for this, but he is, he is admonished for lying about his wife. Same thing. And we see that that Isaac flourishes in Gerar. In fact, he gathers so much that he's asked to leave. Okay, so I don't know. You put in the chat room if you think it's the same of Imelech or not. Um, one thing you have to consider is that this is probably somewhere between eighty to a hundred years after the time Abraham was in Gerar and spoke to an Abimelech. Remember um, that, uh, that Abraham was 100 years old by the time uh, uh, Isaac was born. And, and now Isaac was 60 when his, when his children were born were born and this encounter that Abraham had with Abimelech was before Isaac was born so we're talking somewhere between 80 to 100 years ago so you think it's the same Abimelech or do you think it's a different one the story is very similar it's so similar that some people have suggested that this couldn't have been actually a real event um, it's in the Bible so I have to accept it as a real event but I do know that it is so similar to that other story that it makes you wonder, whoa, how could this happen? First of all, how could Isaac not have learned from what his daddy did? Or maybe he did intentionally what his daddy did to try to, you know, gain what his daddy get, get, gained at that time. So you do have some responses. Mm-hmm. So the Robinson reader says no, it's not the same. Okay. But she asked the question that um, she asked wasn't Abimelech a title? Because you do I think see Abimelech again in like judgments or something like that. Yeah, uh, perhaps. But in this case, I think it's a it's a personal name. I think it's used really as a personal name. 
Could have been his son. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I. Sister Han Angie Hendrick says, uh, son. Son? Okay. Anybody else? Yeah, I'm always, I'm always admonishing you to read the Bible. And see what the Bible says. And as many commentaries that we read, or many experts that we hear about uh, who put different spins on the Bible, what we do is we read exactly what the Bible says. So maybe what we ought to do is go back to Genesis 20 and see what the Bible says about that encounter with Abraham. So if you flip back to Genesis 20. Uh, I just started verse 1. It says, And Abraham journeyed from thence toward the south country and dwelt between Kadesh and Shur, and sojourned in Gerar. Okay, Gerar, same name. And Abraham said of Sarah, his wife, she is my sister. And Abimelech, king of Gerar, sent and took Sarah. Okay, wait now. Let's break that down. Abraham said Sarah was not his wife, but his sister. And he spoke to Abimelech, king of Gerar. So it's very clear that this Abimelech is not a title. Because the title is king. I, I don't know, Pastor. Yeah, you can, you can look at it. All I can say is what the Bible says. Now, you can look at different ways of reviewing it and uh, different commentators. But the, I read a com the commentary I read was that these were different Abimelechs. From different generations. But I'm just reading the Bible. That's all I'm doing. Yeah. And the Bible says this Abimelech was king of Gerar. Gerar. But God came to Abimelech in a dream by night and said to him, Behold, thou art but a dead man for the woman which thou hast taken, for she is a man's wife. And that goes on and on and on and on about that. And then um, at the end, let's flip down to verse 12. And yet indeed she is my sister, she is the daughter of my father, but not the daughter of my mother. She became my wife. And it came to pass when God caused me to wander from my father's house, and I said to her, This is thy kindness which thou shalt show unto me in every place whither we shall come. Say unto me, here's my brother. And Abimelech took sheep and oxen and men servants and women servants and gave them unto Abraham. Okay, that's the story. Now, flip over to Genesis 26. What does the Bible say? about this Abimelech. Does it say anything about him being the son or a different Abimelech or that we're referring to the title? Just see what the Bible says. Genesis 26 says, And there was a famine in the land besides the first famine that was in the days of Abraham and Isaac went unto Abimelech. Here it says, King of the Philistines unto Gerar. Okay. It doesn't say Abimelech titled the title of Abimelech who was king of Philistines who was the son of the first Abimelech it doesn't say any of that all it says is Abimelech king of the Philistines in the garage what I'm trying to get you to see is you can you can read all different kind of commentaries you can put whatever spin you want to put on it but the Bible doesn't say it just says it's an Abimelech so Jessica, what were you gonna have to? What were you gonna say about that? I was just gonna say that I think it's also important to look at etymology of words. Yes, etymology is a big word. What does etymology mean? It is the origin of words. Okay, origin of words. I think it's important to look at that. Uh -huh. And there's quite a bit of research that suggests that Abimelech is a title given to rulers or kings over and over again in the Jewish Bible or in the Hebrew Bible regarding um, rulers. Mm -hmm. outside of the Israelites. Uh, and and so I just think that's something to consider. I do not think it's the same Abimelech. I think that, I mean, just basic reason can get us to that. It's probably not the same Abimelech based mm -hmm. on years and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. um, but, I, I, you know, I, I would argue mm -hmm. that it is a title um, given to Philistine kings or rulers to designate them as those other than 
and, and it's possible. It's possible. It could be that you could refer to Pharaoh, you know, Pharaoh this of this generation, Pharaoh of that generation. Pharaoh is a king. You know, who knows? What we do know is that there were that same name, call it name or title, of Abimelech is seen in two different stories in two different generations. In the exact same place, with the almost the exact same story. So how do you explain all of that? Um, maybe we can't explain it. We just have to accept it. I will say this. Uh, one of the... Um I think Brother Lampkin is on here. Mm -hmm. He talks about, he said, like father, like son. When you start reading it and this, you know, he's, he made that mention. Then also, Sister Martin said, Isaac wasn't born at the time. But as you said, Pastor, we do things that our parents may have done. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. I believe that both were sons of their fathers in blood and, uh, uh, and likeness. And mm -hmm. then also, Sister mm -hmm. Paula Johnson said, is Abimelech the same one that was with David living with the Philistines? And she said, I don't know. So there's another mention of an Abimelech in mm -hmm. David's time, another time. Yeah. And then also, mm -hmm. uh, Reverend Porter says, I don't think it's the same person do, uh, during Abraham time. Yeah, mm -hmm. and Deacon uh, Jerry Hampton also mentioned about the Philistine. It's a dynastic, dynastic title. Okay, okay. So it could be a title, but what about what about Jesus or Joshua? A name that we see often. Uh, we 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 know Jesus or Jesus, as some people pronounce it, the Christ, and Jesus was just another name that was common at that time okay but we know Jesus the Christ is different from other Jesus uh, you know or whatever so anyway we don't know if it was the same or not we but the other thing is we know folks lived for a long time back then you know living for over a hundred years was relatively common according to what we read in the scripture all we know is that it's the same story, almost. And it's weird. It's kind of weird that it just happened the same way you would think Isaac would have learned not to lie. Uh, and the lie for almost the same reason. <laughs> his wife was too pretty for, um, for him to admit that she was his wife. Generational curses and tendencies are a real thing. You see it throughout the Bible. Yeah. People doing exactly what they folks did before them and we do it too. Yep. Mm -hmm. And so, of course, Abimelech discovered the deceit when Isaac was sporting with his wife. So I want to ask you, what, is, what does your version of the Bible say at that verse? Uh, where is it? Uh, where he found out he was sporting with his wife. That's verse 8. What does your Bible say? If you're not reading the, the King James Version, what does your Bible say for that word sporting? looked out Abimelech looked out and he saw Isaac according to the King James Version sporting with his wife does anybody have any other version it's like I'm trying to talk to y'all and I can't see you but I know you're out there <laughs> so what do you think what does your Bible say uh, you said around verse 8 yeah the English Standard Version says, When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of a window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. Laughing. Okay. Any other versions? Okay. Um, Dr. Lillian Jones says, New King, uh, New King James Version says, Showing endearment. Showing endearment. Uh, Sister okay. Rosalind Reader says the New Living Translation says caressing. Caressing. Sister Ridley also says the NIV version says caressing. 
caressing. Yes. If you read some other versions, it'll say kissing. Some other versions will say dancing. Okay. The, the bottom line is he was having some kind of intimate relationship with his wife that tipped Abimelech off that this was probably not the man's sister. Because this is not how you behave around a sister. And uh, so when he figured that out, he he confronted uh, Isaac about it. Isaac uh, admitted his deceit. And amazingly, there is not the kind of contention that we saw when, when Abraham was in Egypt or when Abraham lied to Abimelech in Gerar. It's not that same kind of contention. It's not that, like, I'm angry that you did this. Uh, basically, what, what Abimelech said to the people is, leave this man and his woman alone. And that was it. And, and Isaac was able to flourish in Gerar. And he flourished so much that he got too much for the people around him. Right? And Abimelech said, verse 16, Isaac, you got to leave from here, for you are mightier than we are. Yes. Sister Pearlyn Mason says, out of the Life Application Bible, mm -hmm. says he looked out the window and saw them making love. Yes. I wasn't going to say that part, because <laughs> I was going to try to keep it PG. But <laughs> But I guess it's PG. PG. It could be, well, you know, but I can I can I can add a PG thirteen version. We don't have to do that. Okay, we don't have to do the PG. I'll leave the PG thirteen no, version is. out. But <laughs> the, Mason helped you out. she helped me. Uh, but the, the the whole thing is there were there were intimate relations going on that you know. Showed Abimelech this was this was not just his 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 sister, um, but he didn't put him out. He let him flourish in Gerar until he flourished so much that he said, "You got to leave." And that was what prompted that first question that I gave you. You know, do you do you get so concerned about the growth and the strength and the power? of someone among you that you have to say to them you must leave because you're too mighty and that's what happened to, that's what happened to Isaac and you know I, I I know we say we shouldn't do this and obviously we shouldn't I think it, it, it our values would say that you should not do something like this but in practicality we do it all the time we do it uh, one of, the, one of the things that's uh, uh, critical in our history as a nation is that if a if a company becomes too large and too monopolistic, we break it up intentionally because it's too powerful. And we we talked about um, back in the recession of two thousand eight. Uh, about um, banks that are too large to fail, right? So they were shored up by our government. You get a ball player that's Dejounte Murray, that's 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 so luminescent that we we say, well, we can't afford him; he's got to go. Or let's just be let's break it down to the church. We have a, 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 a prominent pastor who has a, a prominent um, assistant or associate, and that assistant or associate becomes too powerful. And, and the pastor says, you got to go. Am I making this up? No. <laughs> this is real. These, this, these are real examples of what happens and that's what happened with with, with Isaac in this situation. Yeah, it probably was a hard decision for Abimelech when you think about mm -hmm. 
Isaac's neighbors are destroying wells that were necessary for the community. Mm -hmm. And so, like, it's one of those things, especially since he didn't do anything about Isaac's lying. He might have had to tell him to leave because the people rose up against Isaac. Or maybe the king was concerned that Abimelech would have too much. I'm sorry, Abimelech was concerned that Isaac would have too much power. And too much authority and influence over the people. That's usually what happens. And frame shift now, several hundred years later, the same thing happened to the children of Jacob or Israel, will be the children of Isaac. We haven't gotten to that part yet. But when they went into Egypt, they became so prominent that the, the Pharaoh at the time said they are too mighty. And so we gotta we gotta do something about this. And the first thing he said was kill all the kill all the male children. Make them work hard. That's a, that's another story. But these are real examples of people being afraid of folks becoming too powerful. Right? And getting jealous. Practically, it's, it's a real thing. Even even among churches, you know, people get jealous of of different uh, 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 church congregations or fellowships because they're perceived to have too much power. Not making it up. Uh, so be aware that haters will seek to tear you down. Even as God lifts you up, haters will seek to tear you down, even as God lifts you up. So here's the second question. When should one push back against haters who try to push you out? These are interesting questions, huh? When should one push back against haters who try to push you out? So what we see in this story with Isaac is that he just leaves. In this next section, we're going to read about that. He didn't push back against Abimelech. He just left. Would you do that? If, if someone says to you, you got to leave because you're too mighty. Would you just leave or would you push back? That's too hard a question, isn't it? No, people just have to give them a chance to respond. So, so Patricia West Hardeman said, uh -huh. when you are standing on the word of God, that was her. Okay, when you stand on the word. That, you can always push back when you stand on the word of God. Mm -hmm. The question is, sometimes you don't know if you're actually standing on the word of God. Unfortunately, sometimes people have different perspectives of the word of God. God. Take, for instance, the issue of abortion. Some people say standing on the word of God means you should never have an abortion. Others say standing on the word of God means you should give women a choice over their own bodies. So sometimes that can is not as easy as it may seem. Yes, yeah, somebody else. Dr. Lillian Jones says probably when God tells you to leave or push back. Okay, being directed by God, uh, essentially the Spirit of God is telling you whether to leave or to stay. Okay, that's a good answer. Brother that's the right Lampkin way. Uh -huh. says, I'm not playing that game of pushing back as a family man with wife, children, responsibilities. Mm -hmm. Get out of there to keep your family safe. Uh -huh. Especially if they're destroying your property, the wells. What's okay. Next? Okay. Sister Hardy says, I have thought that. Sister Lysandra, mm -hmm. Sandra Wilson says, leave and let the Lord fight your battles. Interesting. One more. Sister mm -hmm. Regina Peaches says we should always stand firm for what we know is right. Mm -hmm. But if that's not our place of promise, it's okay to leave. That's why we have to know God's word for ourselves. Mm -hmm. Sister Rosa and Rita, she says, depending on circumstances, whatever, I feel my spirit. 
Whatever I feel in my spirit. Uh huh. Okay. And Sister Diana Mitchell says, when you must protect yourself or family, or when God directs, uh, becomes an issue of moral compass. Because Chris mm -hmm. Johnson says, push back against haters the minute they step to you, hmm. if you are in the will of God. Sister mm -hmm. Allison Martin says, when the fight is not in the will of God, you should. Hmm. When the fight is not in the will of God, you should leave. Uh, Brother Lampkin's uh, response is quite interesting. Um, when he, when I, when you read that response from him, I started thinking about what happened in Tulsa. Uh, he he said, "I'm not playing this game of pushing back. I'm getting out of there to protect my family." I thought about what happened in Tulsa way back. I think it was 1920. When Black Tulsa was torched by a mob, what was the appropriate response for a black business owner at that point to get out as quick as possible, or to stay and fight? I thought about what happened in Watts. Remember what happened in Watts way back in the in the riots in, in, in L.A. when things was were burning all over the city, and there were some business owners who said, "This is a black business, leave me alone," uh, or they, they're saying, "We su we we support the black community, don't 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 burn us down." But some people had to stay. And fight. So when is it appropriate to stay and fight, or when is it best to pack up and leave? Not always an easy question. So. But I appreciate you all's responses. Genesis twenty six seventeen through twenty five. Genesis twenty six seventeen through twenty five. This is what it says. And Isaac departed thence. Okay, there you go. Once Abimelech said, "Get out of here," Isaac left. And pitched his tent in the valley of Gerar and dwelt there. So he left, but he stayed in that region of Gerar, pitched his tent in a valley. Right? And Isaac digged to gain the wells of water, which they had digged in the days of Abraham his father. For the Philistines had stopped them after the death of Abraham. And he called their names after the names by which his father had called them. And Isaac's servants digged in the valley and found their well of springing water. All right. Okay, wait now. He's kicked out. He goes into the valley. He unstops wells and finds an underground well of springing water. An underground spring. All right. So the Lord has blessed him despite the situation. But look at, what, look at what happened here in verse 20. And the herdmen of Gerard did strive with Isaac's herdmen, saying, The water is ours. And he called the name of the well Esek, because they strove with him. And they digged another well. Okay, so Isaac left there, went somewhere else. They digged another well, strove with that also, and he called the name of it Sitna. All right. And he removed from this, left there, and digged another well. For they, they strove not, and he called the name of it Rehoboth. I guess I'm pretty, pronouncing that right. Rehoboth, Jessica says a dead language, so you can pronounce it any way you want to. I don't know. I said about Greek, I said about Hebrew. Okay, about Greek, not <laughs> Hebrew. Okay. Don't, I don't know. Don't Rehoboth, me. Rehoboth, Rehoboth, <laughs> Rehoboth me. whatever. <laughs> Something like that. And name of it Rehoboth, and he said, For now the Lord hath made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. All right. Um, read on a little bit further. And he went up from thence to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared unto him the same night, and said, I am the God of Abraham, thy father. Fear not, for I am with thee, and will bless thee, and multiply thy seed for my servant Abraham's sake. And he built an altar there. And called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants digged the well. Alright, so Isaac left and went to the valley of Gerar. He dug wells, 
of his father that had been stopped up, the herdsman of Gerar claimed those wells. And he left at least two of them, Esek and Sitna. And he dug another one, Rehoboth. And, uh, and he said, there the Lord has made room for us. That well, I'm told, is about eight hours south of uh, Beersheba. So he went a long distance to build that, to dig that, that third well. And it didn't bother him when he went far, far away. He, he said, the Lord had made room for us. And the Lord appeared to him at Beersheba. He went back to Beersheba. Remember, that's where uh, Abraham had made his headquarters. And, the, and, and reiterated, the Lord reiterated the covenant uh, at when, when uh, he went back to Beersheba. It's interesting that the Lord appeared to, uh, to Isaac uh, as a patriarch. Uh, the Lord didn't always appear to, to, to people in that manner, but he appeared to Isaac and, um, and reiterated the covenant. And Isaac built an altar there. And so, you know, the Lord will show up uh, when you need him. Here's, here, here's an interesting review. God always works things out for our good. So he went to Esek. He built a well there. He called it Esek. And, and that means contention. He built the next one, Sitna. And, and because of, uh, of the controversy there, he left. And he, that Sitna means enmity. And then Rehoboth, it, it means plenty of room. So sometimes God uses your enemies to displace you from empty places so he can establish you in full places. That's what happens sometimes. All right, third question. What conditions, if any, must be met before you seek a covenant relationship with a brother or a sister? What conditions, if any, must be met before you seek a covenant relationship with a brother or a sister? So if you have a relationship with uh, with someone and you seek to make a covenant with that person, what, what conditions must be met before you go into that covenant? Seems like these days sometimes people just aren't making covenants. It's maybe easier uh, to continue without a covenant. And you know, a covenant is more than just a contract. Or a promise. A covenant is a is a very deep oath, promise. You know, it's it's something that is should ne never be broken. Uh, so sometimes people will find it easier not to do that, not to do covenants. So what what conditions should be met? So Mr. Hardy wrote that you need to establish trust. Mm -hmm. Brother Lampkin said you need to be on the same wavelength or mm -hmm. equally yoked. Equally yoked, okay. Sister Regina Peaches says you have to respect, you have to have respect for one another and trust. Okay. Sister Carolyn Wallace says clarity, understanding. Okay. Dr. Yeah. Lillian Jones says you must see that there can be a, you must see that there can be a potential problem. Okay, so you must seek out. Seek the potential problems that will help you establish that clarity. Yeah. Okay. All right. So Mr. Rosalind Reader said these days it's hard to make covenants because it's hard to trust people. Hard to trust people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Sister uh, Angie Hendricks says equally yoke, respect, and honesty. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And one thing for sure, if you're going to make a covenant with somebody, you do have to establish trust. And then you also have to give up a little bit of something to get something. Which is not always very, you know, satisfying to know I got to give up something. But, but in order for a relationship to actually work through a covenant, somebody has to give up a little bit. In fact, both parties have to give up a little bit. Um, Reverend Porter said, in order to have a relationship with anyone, you must make a promise to one another yeah. and make sure that God is in the mix. Uh -huh. And then Sister Hardy 
also has added you have to make clear directives both will abide by and sister Rosalind Rita said or be willing to lose something and be okay uh -huh. with that loss uh -huh. you're talking about you have to lose something yeah I mean in any kind of relationship you gotta give a little I think that's part of the reason why we have such divisiveness in our Congress is because people have gotten to this issue where they don't want to compromise. Compromise is a bad word now. So you, you stand your ground, the other person stands their ground, and then you have nothing because nobody is willing to give a little. That's part of the reason that the Israelis and the Palestinians are still at, at, at the loggerheads with one another because it's hard for any party to give up what God has promised you. If each party believes God has promised this to me and my people, it's hard. It's hard for any one of them to give up anything. Okay? Mm -hmm. So let's let's look at this right quick and we're almost almost finished. Genesis twenty six verses twenty six to thirty three. Let's read this together. Then Abimelech went to him from Gerar this is Abimelech, who was at Gerar, the, the king there at Gerar. He went to him, Isaac, from Gerar, and Ahuzath, one of his friends, and Phicol, the chief captain of his army. So he doesn't go by himself. He takes a contingent with him. And Isaac said unto them, Wherefore come ye to me, seeing you hate me, and have sent me away from you? And they said, We saw certainly that the Lord was with thee, and we said, Let there be now an oath betwixt us, even betwixt us and thee, and let us make a covenant with thee, that thou wilt do us no hurt, as we have not touched thee, and as we have not done unto thee nothing but good, and as we have done unto thee nothing but good, and have sent thee away in peace, and thou art now the blessed of the Lord. And he made them a feast, and they did eat and drink, and they rose up betimes in the morning, and swear unto and swear one to another and Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace and it came to pass the same day that Isaac's servants came and told him concerning the well which they had digged and said unto him we have found water and he called it Sheba therefore the name of the city is Beersheba unto this day all right so quickly here Abimelech uh, sought this covenant with Isaac and Abimelech sought the covenant interestingly only after he saw that God had prospered Isaac when he saw that, uh, that Isaac had prospered in the land he went to him he came to him while Isaac was at Beersheba and Abimelech uh, and Isaac promised to dwell together in peace uh, but, but not without Isaac pointing out to Abimelech Listen, you didn't have anything to do with me before. You sent me away. And now you come. <laughs> and Abimelech and Isaac, they, you know, they reached this agreement. Um, and it's the same kind of covenant that was made between the elder Abimelech and Abraham. All right, so if you go back to Genesis 20, doing an earlier version here, and we look at what, what happened between Abimelech and Abraham um, started at verse 15 of, in chapter 20 it says and Abimelech said behold my land is before thee dwell where it pleaseth thee and Sarah he said behold I give thy brother a thousand pieces of silver behold he is to thee a covering of eyes unto all that are with thee and with all other thus shall be uh, reproved but that's the end of 20 but I'm sorry I'm on um I think I, I think is at oh man I'm li I'm missing it. And where it talks about oh here it is this is chapter twenty one starting at verse twenty two, and it came to pass at that time that Bimlech and Phicol the chief captain of his host okay same name chief captain of his host spake unto Abraham saying God is with thee and all that thou doest now therefore swear unto me. Hereby, God, that thou wilt not deal falsely with me, nor with my son, nor with my son's son, but according to the kindness that I have done unto thee, thou shalt do unto me, and to the land wherein thou hast sojourned. And Abraham said, I will swear. 
And Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water, uh, which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. And Abraham said, I want not who had done this thing, neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it but today. And Abraham took sheep and oxen and gave them unto Abimelech, and both of them made a covenant. And Abraham set seven ewe lambs of the flock by themselves. And Abraham said unto, uh, and Abimelech said unto Abraham, What be these uh, seven ewe lambs of which thou hast set by themselves? And he said, For these seven ewe lambs shalt thou take of my hand, that they may be a witness unto me, that I dig this well. Wherefore he called the place Beersheba, because they swear both of them. Almost the exact same thing. Uh, except in this case, in, in Genesis chapter 20, there were seven ewe lambs that were signed of the covenant. All right. In, in Genesis chapter 26, between Abimelech and Isaac, the sign of the covenant was a well of water. When they said, we found water. Okay. So when we look at this now, um, they called the city, Isaac and his people called the city Sheba, and the place became known as Beersheba. Beer means well, Sheba means promise or oath of, of seven, or, or seven, it could be a promise or oath, or seven, depending on who you, who you read. So Beersheba could mean a well of the oath, or a well of seven. One thing for sure we've already read that that Abraham had already named the place Beersheba. Now whether this was the same well or another well, it seems like it probably was another well that he that that was dug by Isaac in the same region. And all he did was really recall the name. He named that city the name that had already been circulating in the past. Maybe had maybe that name had fallen out of the people's memories uh, it wasn't as prominent so he 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 reiterated that the place is Beersheba and with that uh, according to the, the scripture it was named Beersheba until that day okay so here's the thing peace between parties is often contingent upon mutual trust as we already said but but sometimes it's uh, the contingent upon mutual fear so maybe Abimelech feared the power of uh, Isaac and Isaac feared the power of Abimelech so they were able to work out something not through mutual uh, uh, admiration but through mutual fear which is something that happens uh, between nations today that's why we have nuclear weapons. Russia has nuclear weapons and we don't want anybody else to have them. We, re we respect each other because of mutual fear not mutual love or admiration. Alright so here's the close. Genesis 26 34 and 35 it just simply says right quickly and Esau was 40 years old when he took to wife Judith the daughter of Biri the Hittite and Bashamath the daughter of Elon the Hittite which were a grief of mine unto Isaac and to Rebekah we end it right there when he was 40 Esau took wives and remember that Isaac was 40 when he took his wife uh, Rebekah uh, so some 60 plus years later uh, we find uh, that Esau takes a wife Esau not not Jacob now we're talking about Esau so Esau took wives and they were from they were Hittites so uh, Esau's persona throughout this section is, is portrayed as contentious he's red and hairy he's he sold his birthright for red pottage he married foreign wives and he, even if you look in Hebrews chapter 12 verse 16 in the New Testament he's described as a fornicator so things uh, aren't stacked up for Esau's favor. Uh, and so we see also the parents became grieved when he took these foreign wives. Uh, but 
parents can be grieved. Uh, unfortunately, we can't choose for our children. Certainly not in America. Uh, people make their own choices, um, and uh, for whatever reason, uh, Esau decided he would take wives of the Hittites, and his parents didn't necessarily like that. There was nothing they could do about it. So this closed chapters 26, but continued the contention between Esau and his family. We'll see that played out as we continue the study from Genesis. Here is uh, the picture I showed last week, which depicts uh, Rebecca arriving uh, from uh, the homeland of uh, Abraham um, and she veiled herself as she saw Isaac coming uh, and then uh, Isaac was 40 years old remember when they got married some 20 years later they had their first child and years after that we see Isaac um, uh, digging these wells that have been stopped up these are the wells that his father had, had dug uh, and they had been stopped stopped up um, and after he dug the wells and they became prosperous uh, at least in the region of Gerar the herdsman of Gerar said wait a minute this is ours and he just he just left and he dug another well each time his this is a uh, uh, just a depiction of uh, of the sons of uh, of Isaac and we're going to be talking about them a little bit more as we go along remember uh, Jacob came out holding the ankle of Esau. Jacob was the younger one, but he was holding the ankle of the older one who was red and hairy. Remember, Jacob uh, uh, kind of tricked Esau, and Esau sold his birthright for some red pottage. And this is a depiction of pottage, or the lentils used for red pottage. Now we learn that Esau had at least two wives, and we're going to find later on that he's going to take a wife of his uncle, a, 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 a daughter of his uncle, so basically his cousin. He's going to marry her as well. So Esau has at least three wives, and maybe even more. This is just a depiction of, of the wives. Uh, that that could have been uh, the, the kinds of wives that Esau took. So not only did he uh, engage in polygamy, but he also took wives of foreign foreign lands. This is just a, a map again to kind of go over some of the things we've been talking about. Uh, Beersheba uh, is uh, sort of the center of where we've been talking about. Gerar is where Abimelech was located. If you look further south, you'll see. Rehoboth, Rehoboth, that is that well that Isaac dug uh, after he was kind of run out of Gerar. So it's disconcerting when others lay claim to your property after you've done all the work toward its improvement, such as when a shark takes the equity in a company that he or she did not build. Such was the case when the herdsmen of Gerar claimed the wells dug by Isaac's people. Notice that Isaac's that Isaac relied on the Lord to fight his battles. When necessary, he moved on and built other wells, which were better than the ones before. Sometimes we have to persevere and let the Lord fight our battles. Surely there is coming a day when he will give us vineyards we did not plant and wells we did not dig if we continue to stand for him, even in this crisis. So that's quickly some announcements. The town hall that we're going to have with the Wheatley High Sports Complex is scheduled for the 28th of July at Bethany First Baptist Church. I hope that you'll be there to help us with that. The New Destiny Gala is uh, is going to happen on the 26th of August, and we're we're looking at making that a virtual uh, event now because of the um, community spread of COVID-19. Back to school drive-through is going to be on the 6th of August. Uh, we'll look at revisiting the Vacation Bible School if we have time and before the kids go back. And um, I want to remind you again to keep in mind uh, the up to upcoming midterm elections. Don't forget that's very, very important uh, because every vote matters. Uh, continue to pray for the neighborhood, the state, and the nation. Uh, that is the end of our study tonight. We appreciate you for being a part of this study. Um, and uh, I know I've kept you a little bit long, so I'm going to close now, and let's just have a word of prayer. God, we thank you for the time of study. 
We pray that you will bless us so that we might be more of the people you would have us to be. We're praying for those who are sick among us, those who are going through trials and tribulations. Bless in your mighty name. We pray for our president, our governor, our mayor, our elected officials. We pray for the Supreme Court of this these United States. We pray for uh, men and women who are charged with defending this these United States. Help us, Lord. Uh, we pray for uh, your servants, your preachers, your ministers, mm -hmm. uh, those who stand in the gap to proclaim your holy word. We pray for the teachers uh, who labor uh, in the word. Uh, if we've done or said anything that is amiss, or done or said anything that's uh, trampled upon the sensibilities of those uh, who are our uh, members, our guests, our congregants, we pray that you would forgive. Yeah. Hold us in the hollow of thine own hand and we give you the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. God bless you now. I hope you have a great night and we'll look Bye. to see you on Sunday.